My name is Dusty Walter. I'm going to be the moderator for this session. I, uh, a part of my background, I am a forester by education, but my PhD, my philosophy degree, as uh, John put it, was in dealt with civil pasture and looked at the growth of trees and uh, oak trees in a thinned forest. So all my degrees are in forestry. Um, but now I'm in administration. I also spent 11 years in the Center for Agroforestry working on promoting agroforestry practices. Then I transitioned into administration. Um, I don't wear the hard hat or the chaps near as often anymore. And, uh, and I sport a cowboy hat, which I may not be normal forestry attire, but I, uh, you know, when you deal in the ag world, uh, livestock have a real prominent role to play. We've seen everything today from sheep to cattle to, to poultry, including ducks and chickens. And, uh, and they are a final, nice final value added product coming from the landscapes that we manage and can be integrated in ways that are very regenerative in nature. So I'll be moderating today. And we have two individuals participating with us today who are gonna present from their perspective. Uh, the first I'll introduce to you is, is Wynn Miller. Wynn Miller's an environmental consultant based in East Tennessee specializing in climate smart agriculture, civil pasture, and intergenerational farm transitions. She's a fifth generation farmer and serves as COO of Lick Skillet Farm. Are you gonna share more with us about Lick Skillet Farm? I'm kind of curious, but uh, as somebody who enjoys cooking, I, I, that caught my eye. So, um, and uh, she works in her family's century farm. She's previously worked as a licensed landscape architect in the field of stormwater management and ecological landscape design. Currently, she's engaged in developing grazing and land management scenarios that uh, reintegrate native species into southeastern woodlots and pasture lands. So we'll start there with you, Wynn, and then we'll transition over to Eli, and I'll introduce you when you're up, all right? Well, thank you all for having me. I feel like a little odd being, I feel like I'm like the only southerner in the room. <laughs> Woo! Hey boys! Um, I'm really happy to be here. I feel like a real oddball in East Tennessee that doesn't ever get to talk about um, this stuff and none of my neighbors know what agroforestry or civil pasture is, neither does my NRCS agent. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to come and um, talk to y'all. Um, so my understanding was um, this session was supposed to be about um, kind of climate and environmental context and how that drives uh, silvopasture design. And I thought this um, session made sense for me because my kind of um, little contribution to the field thus far has been kind of a reaction to um, getting specifications, getting guidelines, seeing case studies in the way it was done elsewhere, and then going, well, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. In all cases, in most cases, it's because I've actually tried it before. Um, so East Tennessee is a little bit different. Um, obviously, the climate is different here, but the farm context, um, I think, is also different from um, kind of like what Julie Hager said this morning. I feel like I come at this from a slightly different perspective, so I'll share a little bit of that with you all, and um, I think that informs uh, how I ended up, you know, making civil pasture work for us. So, yeah, I grew up on a family farm, and I don't know if Josh is still here, but when he was talking about um, growing up working on the, and we actually I started growing, when I was growing up, we farmed tobacco, um, the 13-month crop, and so um, it was a lot of family interaction. There was a lot of work more than picking up rocks and six to do um, for a little kid, and so uh that's what our family did and you can make a living on a really small amount of tobacco or at least you could and then that changed in about 97 98 i think it was when they outsourced tobacco and our region has never recuperated the small farms have never recuperated my um life has kind of progressed as all of our barns have kind of um you know kind of fallen apart over time so you drive around our community and the productive capacity is just uh, really lost and it shows economically um, there's a lot of young guys that don't have a lot of options we have a lot of social ills um, a lot of economic problems and 
um, hard to find meaning and really hard to find even uh, worthwhile part-time employment, much less full-time employment on those small farms. So um, one of the things that we've tried to do, our farm's been around um, since 1919. And so we've got a lot of infrastructure in place. Um, we were doing cattle because where we live, it's like this everywhere. So we've only got small patches that are flat enough to grow tobacco and you have to move the tobacco around. All the areas that aren't in tobacco, you would typically run with cattle. Um, so when we quit doing tobacco, we moved entirely to cattle. We worked about 20 years on our genetics. Um, about 20 years ago, my parents got a hold of Jim Garrish's book and we went from five bales per winter per animal to one bale per winter per animal. Um, uh, so we've got our grazing management pretty well dialed in, water systems, uh, fencing systems. And so that's more than a lot of young, you know, most young farmers going in, obviously the land is the biggest cost, but then all the infrastructure is just like even more. So our idea was let's employ other people. Let's give them, if they want a full-time job farming, let's give them a full-time job farming. So we employ about seven full-time people and uh, two to four part-time, depending on how you count, you know, it's a family farm. Um, we manage about a thousand acres and um, most of that is for cattle. We run um, a cow-calf operation as well as a grass finishing operation. So we would do both of those. Um, on the same land, but they're technically two different um, businesses. And then we also do hogs, uh, layers and broilers and sheep. Um, and we like to consider ourselves a regenerative farm. You know, that word has kind of <laughs> become a trendy word. Um, but we do a lot of different environmental stuff of things. And when I came back to the farm, um, I left my previous job and working for the government and had that for too long. When I came back, I was like, how can I bring my um, environmental background to farming and kind of fix the things that I see that are wrong. And we'd already made a lot of moves in that direction, I think, but um, uh, managing our our pastures and woodlands better and then um, implementing new silva pasture was kind of what um, I got involved with. Um, so, yeah, right now I've got... 400 trees in the program. They're all just shade trees. They're actually all under carbon uh, contract. Um, I could answer questions about that if you'll have them. Um, but they're, they're shade trees. And, and my goal was like to get the tree to grow. I've been planting some trees and flowers and shrubs and cattle fields since I was a little girl and they all died. Um, and so you know, mortality was 100%. And so as I started to formalize it, uh, I had to get real serious about tree protection. I've tried just about everything out there. Um, and I kept reading about things that other people would do. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try that. And just none of it would work. None of it would work. And my mortality was, even with good weather, you know, my mortality over the first five years, I would say, was over... 75 percent you know in some plantings it would be 90 or 100 percent within the first few years so, i mean basically i was just doing it wrong and i didn't i was hoping there was a right way to do it i was a little worried there was no way to do it but the primary causes of mortality were you know drainage issues too much water too little water um but we have a pretty good climate and i'll um I won't go into depth on what our climate is just because I'll be talking for way too long, but I can get back into that um, if need be. But we have a very rich, uh, luscious climate where trees just grow like weeds. So generally the the weather, you know, provides. Um, but the other things where cattle can kill our trees in a variety of different ways, and they can also get bush hogged over. Uh, my dad can bush hog anything. Um, so... After several years of experimentation, I now have a protection system that I believe is much like Austin's. It's a planter tube with polywire between the tubes. I run the polywire on the top so the cattle can go under the base. And then I wrap the polywire halfway down the tube. And that has been incredibly successful. So now that mortality is just reversed. I basically practically get 90 to 100% mortality, I mean, success on all my plantings now. And I reduce the cost from, you know, Early on when I wasn't keeping great records is a little bit hard to say, but it was like as upwards of like 50 
to, you know, depending on how you count, like $100 per living tree, if you count long enough for all that mortality to catch up with you. It's a very expensive um, process. Of course, when your mortality is 100%, that's kind of infinite dollars per living tree. But anyway, over time, my goal was like, I was trying to make sense of it. And I was like, what can I kind of sell this to my family for, for if we're going to have shade trees? And my goal was like $25 a tree. And I've gotten... I, I need to update this number, but I've gotten it down to, um, as of like a year and a half ago, I had per living tree at two years, all materials and labor for like about $24. And so I considered that a great success. So now we have um, kind of my archetype that seems to work. And not only are the trees surviving, but they're also just growing great. And that's mainly due to how great the planter tubes are. I do not sell them. <laughs> um, but I am kind of religious about these tubes. I'll use them even when I don't need to protect them from grazers just because they're such great tubes for growing tall, straight trees and everything. Um, but yeah, now, so we're, we figured out the shade thing. And then, I, and I knew that's one of the things is like farm context. And I, I might, Dusty might have questions about that too. So I'll put off a little bit more of our farm context, but essentially we're cattle farmers, you know, burgers pay the bills for us. And so you know, initially going into it, I did not want to have to fool with. Also, I've been farming since I was a kid. Everyone's like, oh, what a blessing. I'm like, you mean burden? <laughs> like, it's a thousand friggin' acres. It's like 14 barns. I never sleep. <laughs> like, do you know how much one roof costs? I never sleep, you know? So it's just like, that's my attitude. And so when people are like, why don't you grow trees that you also have to gather pecans from? I'm like, what? no <laughs> like that sounds awful I'm trying to make my job easier so that was the initial thing is like shade trees were our critical reason for doing it and I think that's similar to a lot of folks with silva pasture as opposed to other types of agroforestry there's a list a million different reasons to do it but what's your critical reason for us it was shade and not just directly I could talk more about the indirect benefits of shade and how they benefit our grazing management program it kind of drives um uh, improved capacity across the farm, whether it's under the tree or not. But I really focused on just getting the trees for shade. And then once I've got them, I'm hoping with the EAP to um, take on an additional purpose for those trees, um, uh, the, which might have an additional income stream. But up until now, we've just been focused on that. But that's all. I'm sorry I was so long-winded. <laughs> not long-winded. PhD potential. So... All right. Um, our next panelist is Eli Roberts. Eli is an agroforestry planner with Interlace Commons who works with farmers across the Northeast. As a forester, farmer, and consultant focusing on ecological forest management and agroforestry systems, he is particularly interested in civil pasture and conservation biocontrol. Look forward to hearing more about that. He has helped forest landowners upgrade their management plans to enroll in NRCS programs and developed watershed scale forest conservation strategies with NGOs. Eli has written a guide to forest to managing forest in a changing climate and a book chapter on agroforestry for the Northeast. He attended Villanova and Yale for his degrees in psychology and forestry. You shortchanged the whole process. You went psychology. Oh, yeah, not quite philosophy though, right? But kind of a in a roundabout way. So he has been a teacher, social worker, gardener, and project manager, and a part-time chestnut orchardist. He loves watching sheep eat leaves from a row of coppiced mulberries. Eli currently works as a technical service provider at Interlace Commons. Thanks. All right, Eli. And I have no idea whether you wish to try this remote or just gesture towards the back, but we'll give it to you anyway. Great. We'll uh, give it a try. Uh, um, I'm going to give you a very brief uh overview of Interlace Commons and what we do so that we can get to uh, our discussion. Thanks for the intro. Uh, here we go. Interlace Commons, uh, you can see the, uh, the mission statement as written. Basically, we want to, basically we want to help people plan and plant agroforestry practices, both in their sort of modern forms, but also with uh, openness to, to more ancient forms, uh, kind of the, the long history that Dr. Conway was talking about earlier. Uh, we, so we focus on, in that second part, uh, field projects, education, and research throughout the Northeast. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, this is a brief uh, list of our design process, which uh, if you're familiar with natural resource planning, looks familiar. Uh, we we emphasize the farm narrative and uh, goals articulation as as a place where people can can define you know are are we growing trees for a crop or are we growing trees for shade and and uh, that guides uh, our design process going on. We do the, the resource inventory and site assessment, come up with a concept plan, bat some ideas around, and then come up with a final planting plan, which then leads us to an implementation management plan. Um, a key point here is is someone earlier mentioned you know you can't just say there's whatever 50 kinds of trees and all kinds of arrangements you can plant them in what do you want right and 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 i i'm getting more the, the more i do this work the more excited i am about um, articulating constraints as a helpful piece of design you know if your equipment is needs 50 foot spacing between the trees you can't consider any spacing closer than 50 feet great that decision is made so so we try to um systematize that kind of thing. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the big uh, pieces of work that we do is this cooperative agreement with Vermont NRCS, where we uh, train their staff in agroforestry practices, and we train farms and uh, come up with plans for them. And, and we're also working on uh, recommendations to update the practice standards and uh, aim at scenarios to reflect, to, to, to better reflect the actual, the, like the true cost of planting trees, um, because it's it's hard to be motivated for a, a 90 cent per tree payment. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, other work that we've done in the uh, training realm is collaborate with uh, Savannah Institute and ASD to create these online courses, which you can see if you go to um, learnagroforestry.com slash professionals. You can get to those. Uh, a couple of them are free, and a couple of them cost some money. And and so we do other trainings. Uh, we work under four or five or six different grant programs. So uh, so there's always a training depending on where we are and who we're working with. Uh, next slide. We've got two upcoming books sometime soon. Uh, one is a, a manual about tree fodder and tree hay, kind of uh, summarizing the systems from from around the world and making recommendations for how to make those systems work here in the US, uh, and then a, a manual for alley cropping. Next slide. Oh, great. Um, I also want to plug in a slide that I missed. Uh, uh, Interlace put out a, a report called Up From the Roots, which focuses on uh, racial equity, sorry, racial equity and racial justice within agroforestry work. Um, I recommend it. Uh, it's, it's on the website. Uh, interlacecommons.org slash research, I think. Um, and it's it's basically uh, with the target audience of organizations promoting or or facilitating agroforestry, how do we also bring a racial justice lens to this work that often doesn't emphasize that? So uh, follow us on Instagram. We've got a couple of great consultants up here before you today, right now. You've heard some great talks throughout the day. Today's session, uh, this closing session may be titled Across Regions and Climates, but we've already discussed a lot that has to do with um, how you choose what trees and where you plant those trees, a whole host of things that, that climate may impact, uh, that varies across regions. Um, what questions have you developed as the day has progressed that we can ask Eli and Wynn up here? Um this is for you. Uh, I was curious that it sounded like your greatest roadblock to success was the protection of the trees and you came up with this system and how did you come up with that system and where can I learn more about it? I love to talk about my dad. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, okay. So, I mean, that's really what like the at the kernel of um, what I kind of thought this um, session might be about. There's, I think that we could talk about a billion different things, most of which y'all have already spoken about. But I was trying to think what's something that I could offer um, that might be relevant. And I don't think it's wrapping polywire around tubes. I, if anybody can 
help me find a way that I don't have to do that and I can grow trees, please tell me. But that's what's become most cost effective for me. And what I wanted to do and what might be nice to talk about different solutions um, that Eli and I are familiar with is that he lives up in like snow country and I live down in like warm, you know, balmy weather. And so, and there's probably also differences in um, like in the farm context. So I usually think about my environmental context and our farm context. And so I, I hope that the message that I can get out is not like, oh, here's a tricky way of doing it, do it this way. But it's more like, I tried it all the other ways and it didn't work because of very, because of things I should have been able to predict, you know, but kind of these predictable um, uh, site or farm, you know, context elements that drove the solution. And I think that's applicable to a lot of farms. And then it's like Eli and I were talking previously. Okay. So we all know there's not a cookie cutter thing. Okay. So Okay, thanks guys for reminding us of that. What do we do with that, you know? Um, well, obviously a lot of folks have talked about the important role of consultants today, um, but less frequently, I believe the um, the uh, the concept of, of the of the peer um, organizations has been brought up. And for me, um, all the folks that I know that are are trying out new things and are um someone mentioned like they're worried about the risk and stuff, they're learning from their peers and and not from like case studies or something. And I mean, bless you, University of Missouri and Center for Agriculture. This is so cool. But ultimately, I know that my neighbors want to see something that works in Tennessee, you know, and so I'm very excited about um, the work towards building regional co coalitions that works that I, I hope can come up with not cookie cutters, but kind of cultures that can be passed um, from farmers to farmers so that we aren't all making the same mistakes. Because if y'all are like I am, you hear people presenting and they say, and then I did this and it didn't work. And I'm like, oh, if only you'd talk to me. <laughs> I've done that too. I could have told you not to do it or whatever. So it's, we don't need to keep on every one of us reinventing the wheel. And I think since we know cookie cutter stuff doesn't work, I think that peer to peer culture of agroforestry would work. So that being said, um, the way that I, I'll try to keep this fairly brief and then bug me if any of it is um, to, uh, if it didn't come across. Um, but so we have tons of rain. We have about 48 to 52 inches a year. Um, many, many, um, you know, kind of growing degree days, just lo lots of warm days throughout the year and a long growing season. Um, and we also have really rich soils. So for instance, if we just had the climate where we had lesser soils, um, I remember on a trip with Virginia Tech going up and there was, um, a silva pasture site that was up on the top of a ridge and there, it just, it was fenced with like some like black locust posts that he put in. And I think like a, line of high tinsel, but that wasn't actually stretched. So it was just kind of like, whoop, like, you know, looping around and then the trees were inside of it. And he was like, oh, I just mow it once or twice a year. And there's like almost nothing there. Well, that area had been really, really degraded over time. So the soil was just really infertile. So it's like, okay, well, in that case, the climate's there, but the soil fertility is such that the weeds aren't really an issue for us. Our soil fertility, because we've been doing our grazing management so well over the years, stuff just grows like nuts. So I can literally mow four times a year, and by the end of the year, by the end of the season, I got cuckleberry at like eight foot tall. Um, and that's like every year, unless we just had a, a drought. Um, so mowing was not an issue. Uh, fencing off cattle was not an issue. As soon as I fence off the animals, those weeds grow up, and then I have to like move the fence to mow, which I'd have to mow more than four times a year. Um, watering was not uh, possible because it's like really distributed because I'm doing shade plantings, right? And also because we don't live in a dry area, NRCS won't pay for any irrigation unless we've like watered three times out of the past five years or something. Um, so there were those factors that made us a really powerful growing site, but that also meant our competitors, our competition was really great. So um, that meant... I need the cattle to do the work for me. I need the cattle. We also have a big cattle herd and we manage as densely as we can right now. It's not as densely as I'd like, but we'd love to be getting over 50,000 pounds an acre all the time. Um, sometimes we're only managing like 20,000 pounds or something, but 
it will move through and they'll graze, you know, I want them to be able to graze right up to the tree. And those planter tubes, I think, are like four or six inches or something diameter. So they're able to graze right up to it. I don't fence down. I don't wrap the wire down to the bottom. So they're really coming and doing all that management work for me, which for me as a farmer, since I said like burgers pay the bills, I don't want to have to get out there and mow. That's crazy. We have cattle to do that for us. So that was the first big thing is like, because of, we know that the livestock operation is the number one thing. And then we have this crazy environmental um, setting where stuff just grows like weeds all the time. Um, very, very, very much decrease the amount of space that you can. Um, then I found out how great the planter tubes were compared to all the other tubes on the market. Again, I don't sell them, but they really are. Um, they extend the growing season because they create a microclimate. Um, I've got four-year-old um, red oaks that are in the ground, northern red oaks that are in the ground. They've been there. They went in about this tall, and they now they're about this tall four years later. And the ones that were in the tubes are like seven foot tall now. I mean, they just, for a variety of different reasons, if you're not familiar with them, I'm sure you can look them up. Um, but it really creates this little mini greenhouse effect, and we get these long um, trees focused on their top growth. When they come out the trop, that means they still have some strengthening to do before you can take the tube off, but there's kind of a second phase of strengthening um, that I'll let them do. Um, but then energizing them, so basically because we need the cattle up there, the, it, because it's cattle, not sheep or goats or something, like we can't just leave. As soon as the cattle see the white tubes, they're very visually apparent. They're six-foot tall white tubes. They're very visually apparent. So as soon as the cattle see them, they think they're a toy. I don't know if our cattle are just different, but our cattle are like really frisky and they will like those metal cages, those Arbor Shield metal cages, which I call wrist rippers. They're like 10 gauge wire cut on an edge. My steers will just like, after they're done ruminating, they're like, oh, I'm ready to play a little. They'll just go over and dismantle those. Like they're with toys and then eat the tree out from underneath them. And they will try to pull the white tubes off like a little game and carry the tubes around. Um, like I started out by putting cardboard on the ground underneath wood chips. They were like, oh, cardboard, cool. Take cardboard off. So I had to uh, energize them. And then they're like, oh, we have to stay away from those. Um, and it works really well for them because that memory, when I first started training them, I thought they'd need more than just the visual. So I, I experimented with some other ways of training them on the tubes, but really just the visual of a huge white vertical thing in the field. They really remember it well. Um, and what was the other part that I was going to say? I blanked on it. I'll think of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can I just quickly say I'm I uh, was excited to hear the advice to to start small but start now and and uh, you know that this question of like what what are the tips and tricks? Uh, I I feel like there's a there's a process a, a tip about the process to you know buy some cheap trees so you know spend. 50 bucks on cheap trees and come up with one or two sort of testing questions, you know, treat half of them one way, treat half of them the other way, because it's as much about like what sort of physically works and what physically doesn't. And also what you have the time and patience for, you know, if you, if you go in with the assumption that, Oh, I'm going to weed whack three times a year. And that's, what's going to make this option work. That's what justifies the cost difference or something. But then you realize, okay, I'm actually not going to do that. You know, uh, uh, I think if you can if you can just sort of limit the one or two testing questions, if it all fails, you you blew a hundred bucks to learn that. Uh, and also, if you have these sort of little experiments, then the people you talk to, your sort of neighbors, and I guess I'm I'm saying this, uh, you know, it, it it's always better to be in the field experiencing agroforestry than hearing somebody talk about it, right? Uh, I I remember uh, being on a, a field tour at Virginia Tech in the summer. In a in a thinned loblolly pine silo pasture, and walking from ninety degrees in the open pasture, seventy five degrees in the silo pasture, and and the like visceral feeling of like oh, I want this like this feels way better, um, you know you you read that you read oh the heat stress reductions in silo pasture great but but like I think uh, experiencing these things helps. We've heard a lot about taking pasture, open pasture systems to a silva pasture system. Let's switch it in reverse. So we heard some from Dr. Conway of taking the forest systems and moving them to a silva pasture system. 
does anyone in the bigger audience have some kind of order of magnitude of cost differences between those two systems? So, so much of it depends on how nice your trees are and who's around to buy them. You know, so, so it's, it's, it's so hard to say just because, because timber markets across the country are so variable and, and, uh, you know, there, there's, um, economies of scale, you know, you can get a logger to come cut 50 acres if you have nice trees at a decent stocking. Um, but, but it, it, so much of it depends on what you're able to, if, if you, you know, how much you're able to bid that job out for. Um, I, I say this both as a forester and also even if I wasn't hiring a forester, that, that, that's kind of, that's the bread and butter of what a forester does is sort of valuing, uh, valuing the trees and valuing what's going to be left over when they're gone. But I don't know if there's a better, more concrete answer. And as a follow-up, and go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, so the use of prescribed burning ahead of thinning and then working it, because it seems like we're most places you're thinning and then prescribed burning, what are the possibilities? Okay, maybe you're not perhaps going to get to a savanna system, but maybe a decent woodland system. Can you do that with just prescribed burning and marginal levels of thinning? I'm sure you you know, if you can manage the intensity or frequency of the fire, like if, if, if you were, if you said, okay, I'm the only tool I'm going to use is fire as many times as it takes, because I don't want to get out a chainsaw or, or sell trees to a logger. I'm, it, it's sort of theoretically possible. Uh, that probably is the more expensive route. How much time you got left? I think you could use ecological processes to get it to an open savanna look, but it's going to take a lot of time because of just your general density of the forest, at least in, at least in Missouri. Now, the further west you go, the more open naturally those forested stands are less dense they may become. But, but I think here, I mean, how much time do you got? It's a good question, right? So um, I was part of the movement to go into the forest and thin the woods to create the civil pasture for the simple fact that I have mature trees there that are already producing shade or other values like acorn crops and other things, right? So you've already got the existing trees on a site where you know what, that they're gonna do well. At least I, I would assume that if you're thinning, you're gonna keep the trees that are adapted to the site and they're doing well, right? So you've got some measure of indicator there. I don't have to come right in and do weed control. The grass won't overtop my trees not if I'm keeping some of the mature ones, right? So there's a lot of reasons to go into the forest. Now, some of our conservation groups, the uh, Department of Conservation in Missouri, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, what they're more promoting are putting trees in the pasture. And I have no problem with that either, but but your question related to a comparison between the true two, and I would say suggest to you that time is a big element there. If what you want is to see this open woodland savanna grazing system than a mature forest stand that you can go into and manipulate right now and put grass into gives you that right now. It's a park-like look, if you will. Um, not that you can't get there by planting trees. It's just going to take you a little bit more time and a lot more hands-on management to a certain extent. And you may suffer some more mortality on your trees. But cost comparison-wise, there is much more cost support. I would, I, and I have, I'm not tapped into the to the programs that support, but I would suggest there's probably a much more cost support for putting trees in the pasture, and the management of those trees in the pasture as well. So there's, so economically, it's costly to go in and thin the woods, and get material out of there. Some of which, even if you do an initial sale, but don't. And, I'm not talking about a logger managed sale, even though I, I know good loggers, but I'm talking about a, a 
a forestry, a forester managed sale, even if you do that, that's going to reduce some of your costs because you get initial revenue, but you're going to have to come in and remove a lot of the mid-story, smaller material that the logger in a sale process is not going to take. Um, however, that's still that small mid-story level material produces an abundant amount of shade if you don't extract it and get it off of there. So there's a, there's a good cost to that. Um, there has been some done work on that in the past. I'd have to dredge it up for you. If, if you're really interested, I can give you a card and, and share with you some of the costs that one landowner estimated that he had. He did. He owned his own equipment and and did the work to thin out his edges and expand his pasture ground into some some of the wooded area. Um, sidebar, he loved what that did in terms of hunting opportunity and recreational uh, time with his with his uh, children for hunting along those edge margins. Um but he also tracked his time, so he knew if somebody else asked him, he could have told he would tell you what he would do something like that for in terms of cost, which was to pull out everything, thin it, and pile it up for you to burn the pile or sell it for firewood or sell it to Ozark Forest Mushrooms to produce shiitake on the logs or whatever. But there's opportunities to use some of the residual you thin, but You'll have to look me up for the exact cost because I'm not going to say it because I'm most likely not exactly correct. But did that input help with the thought process there? Just a, a little follow-up. Uh, agroforestry is sort of necessarily interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary. I think everyone should, everyone who has woods should get or make an angle gauge and practice going out into the woods taking basal area measurements just to sort of feel, you know, what does that? Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, 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 yes. This, this is a, a way of, of uh, comparing forests with different, you know, a, a lot of little trees or a few big trees can have the same sort of amount of tree biomass and shade, which, uh, which is a proxy for a lot of other things. And, and so, so to to the extent that we're we're thinking about how how can we manage forests towards an agricultural end, being able to speak that language of forestry, to, to be able to say, uh, you know, to, to be able to read the papers, the the silvopasture papers that say, okay, this is the this is the density that we've studied, you know, forage productivity under established under a thinned woods, you know, they they thinned it to fifty or sixty square feet of basal area per acre. The more you can go out and sort of know what that is, and 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 say, oh, you know, uh, if I was consulting with you, I would say, all right, how much how much wood is in your woods now? Are you at 120 or 180 or or 30 square feet? So so, uh, the more you can speak that language of the forestry world, uh, the 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 better it will be, and 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 it's a relatively easy thing to sort of get into. When, how does your hot wire, poly wire system work with deer? Well, luckily, uh, deer are less of a problem than cattle. So if I've got it good for cattle, then the deer won't touch it. You know, I mean, to be honest, can you hear me? Is it on? Okay. Um, to be honest, I think the deer avoid um, I mean, we have them a little, we have a lot of deer, but they don't, they don't like to hang around in our, I don't know, they like to stay in kind of marginal areas and stuff. I think maybe they don't like to be around other grazers, but, um, but uh, there was, there'd be no way for them to get to, I mean, the tube is attached to the stake that's holding it up with little like rubber coated wires. So the deer would have to be pretty um, smart to figure out how to get a hold of a piece of foliage and one of the nice things about this is um the way that the, the way these tubes are made there's no like big holes or really anything for the tree to start growing out like those little metal cages and the shorter tubes and stuff you know um there'll be places where the tree's growing out and then the tubes like stuck around it and everything and this really has it growing up in this kind of conical thing so even if they weren't energized there's really no way for the deer to get to the trees and like i said they're six foot tall tubes so they can't get to the top either uh, but then with the additional step of energizing it i assume yeah 
tree tubes and tree protection are a huge topic. And there's a great deal of work out there. Some of what Wynn talked about that really benefited her, like the greenhouse effect inside the tube, can also be problematic. Trees don't harden off as soon, and if you have a hard freeze, that can be problematic. I've I've heard of people who use them, that, but use perforated tree tubes to allow air movement, so it actually helps the tree harden off, and also may limit rodents. Do you have any rodent problems in yours? And the reason I ask that is some the greenhouse effect keeps it nice and toasty in there. I have heard of some people lose trees because a mouse gets up and builds a nest in there. And then what do they chew on while they're nesting in there? Cambium tissue, that nice young tissue on those little seedlings. Have any, have any wasp inside your tubes? Okay. And then there's issues when, the, as, as Wynn mentioned, the tree has to harden off once the top comes out of that tube because it's a little flimsy. It's been protect, in a nice protected environment. At that point, it's maybe vulnerable, too, if a, if a bird comes on and, and lights on it that's a, too heavy, it can snap it off. So having said all of that, if you do not protect your seedlings, the deer love, especially seedlings like the RPM trees from Forest Keeling that are rich in nutrients, ready to start growing, it's like putting candy out there for them. So protection is a must. How you choose to do that, I'm, I was really curious about the polywire that you just example you gave and uh i'm thinking about how to apply that on some of our research farms already yeah there's a couple um videos i think that the link that john fike put up but if you search um uh appalachian sustainable development silvopasture pasture or, or windmill or something like that it will come up and i walk through the polywire i think austin probably has some great videos as well um, of using polywire in tubes. I do think it's what you're saying is really important is like if the tubes do come with their own problems for some weird reason we don't have rodents. I don't know why. Um, we have tons of hawks. Um, I, I don't know why I've never seen any rodent damage but I know a lot of people with tubes do have that problem and there's um, a few different methods. Some people will put gravel in the ground. Some people use like put cod liver oil on it. Some people use these little sheet sheaths until I have that problem come up, I haven't had to worry about it. Um, I will say, though, the slits in the tubes are really important because you got to get airflow through it. And so a quality tube, like the, the six-foot um, planter tubes, they retail at $10 per system. So that's the stake, the tube, little hairnet that goes on the top, and the twist ties that come with it. Um, if you get them wholesale for a whole pallet, they're like six fifty. Now that's a lot more than most of the tubes out there, right? But I've used most of the tubes out there. Most of them are a joke. Um, and yeah, if you put a piece of plastic around a tube with no, you know, not proper ventilation or whatever, or it's, you know, or it's only like UV rated for three years and it falls apart, or what, you know, there's there's clearly downsides. And I, I, the system that I'm doing wouldn't work if that particular tube wasn't so great. Another thing I'll mention other than wasps is if you do start using tubes, take the songbird threat seriously. Songbirds will go down in the tube and die. So they'll they give you a little net to put on the top. Use those nets or you're just killing songbirds. Okay, I'm gonna jump in with a question from the virtual participants. Um, and I, this is one that I might have a little bit of a response to also, if I can, from the Center for Agroforestry side. So the question was about, well, first a comment saying, envious of Vermont's situation, your connections with NRCS, the training opportunities there. How do we create that in other places? The Center for Agroforestry, of course, has been working with NRCS, doing similar things in Missouri for quite some time. And, and we hear this from other folks outside of Missouri, too. Like, how can we recreate this in other places? And I, I want to, I guess, plug a couple things. One is the Agroforestry Training Academy that's been going now for 10 years here is one way that we really took a big step towards um, comprehensive training in our area. And I think what Wynn has been saying about regional, more localized peer connection, that is so much a part of this too. Um, and then having those peers, that, that peer network um, conveying their wishes, their desires to their NRCS staff locally. Um, so 
the, I guess this is a question for both of you, but maybe more directed at Eli about how Interlace Commons has gotten into that working with NRCS for training, agroforestry training. Uh, I think it was a long process, uh, a long process of going into the office and being told, uh, you know, maybe, maybe later, you know, so, so, so I, I think, I think what, what Megan, the founder and my boss did was like, um, a bunch of survey work sort of, um, demonstrating demand, um, so, so that she could go into whatever, whichever NRCS office and say like, look, this is, this is what people are wanting. Uh, we, you know, we, we get you know, whatever, a hundred calls per year and 50% of them are interested in silver pad, you know, whatever, whatever the numbers are, the, the more concrete, uh, the more concrete the, the demand is, that makes sense. Um, you know, uh, all NRCS is, they have more work to do than time and people to do it. So, so, so the, the sort of value proposition of, of this, uh, co-op agreement is, Let's get more conservation done without asking a whole lot more of your staff, which already has a bunch of other worthwhile stuff to do. So I, th I think that, that that sort of orientation makes sense. Um, I will say that the the TSP program is essentially a sort of mini cooperative agreement between an individual and the NRCS. So 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 there is this sort of like big statewide uh, agreement between Interlake Commons and and Vermont NRCS, but but essentially. Uh, it can be done as TSPs also. So so it's, so, it's, so it's not necessarily this sort of like big insurmountable thing to do. There's a, there's like mini, mini versions along the way. And, and I think also, you know, as, as ever, the more you can speak their language, the more, the more fluent anyone is in their language and the way things work, the easier things get. So to that to that end, I am standing right now, right next to our national agroforester for NRCS, Joe Alley. Joe was previously the state forester in Missouri, and we've had a really good relationship with Joe here. And I asked him if I could hand him the mic to also respond to this, and he accepted. Okay. Um, and, and I think what Eli just said is um, really kind of covers the, the gist of it as far as building agroforestry in your location as far as working within RCS. Um, it's, it's really about building relationships locally um, with uh, your field office staff. And, and and sometimes those field office staff, I think Julie kind of alluded to it this morning, um, they might not want to listen <laughs> or they may not. Yeah, that's not the right way to say it, but um, it's a new concept to them. They got a lot of stuff going on and they may not have the time to dedicate to it. it it's, it is a lot about personality, but the other side of the coin is each, each state has a, uh, technical committee and you all have the opportunity to participate on that technical committee. Um, it, it's not an easy thing to break into necessarily easy either, but that's the that's a good way in the door and the university of missouri has done that here in missouri and and to, to good effect and and for other things besides agroforestry as well um so if you take something home as far as working within rcs i would definitely uh, look, look into participating in the state technical committee and ultimately um even that you're, you're probably going to be finding some person at the state level that is a cheerleader because um, really having, having those folks to help you work with your state technical committee folks is, is pretty important too. Um, and I don't want to steal time from you guys up here, but I wanted to say one other thing and just forget about the National Agroforester title. Um, a, a lot of what I've been hearing here today has been about how do I get my trees to grow? Um, I've been working on a training for our folks, for NRCS folks, um, on what agroforestry is. And in that training, I'm going to emphasize to them the fact that it's not forestry. It's more about the agro part. What I'm sitting in here and hearing today, though, is, is there's a key part of forestry that, that 
you all need um, that that is really forestry 101 for um, any recently graduated forester and that's that's how to grow a tree i'm not trying to be uh, negative to anybody <laughs> but it it does seem like something that's really simple but there are as we have heard multiple times over today there are a lot of little key things that you know you as a as a livestock grower um, probably are not familiar with there are plenty of uh, each state pretty much has a uh, forestry agency. Um, and again, a lot of those folks may not be aware of agroforestry, may not be particularly supportive. They can probably talk to you about how to grow a tree, what trees are best adapted in your location, what kind of special um, you know, techniques seem to work really well for them. So I, I would encourage you not just to think about NRCS, um, but also reach out to your state agencies because they, they've got a lot of expertise out there just in how to grow a tree that I think would be really applicable to, to what you're talking about. They might not be able to tell you how to protect it from a cow, but they can tell you how to grow a tree. So thanks, Anna. I'll hand the mic thanks, back. <laughs> And I'll, and I'll just add to that as well. There, there are a great list of resource professionals, including consulting foresters, at least in the state of Missouri. Um, and now the consulting foresters are a little different than the state agency type folks. The state agency folks, I find to be more program driven. It's what's being promoted and funded and, and they're kind of targeted to, to get a lot of those things adopted on the landscape. But the consulting forester works or the consultant in the agroforestry world works for you, the landowner, right? And if you don't like their perspective, you can hire a different consulting forester or a professional. But that profession, that consulting forester works for you, but they bring a knowledge, same as the agroforestry consultant, will bring a knowledge on how to manage and see your tree plantings, especially more, much more likely to succeed. Um, and so use, use what resources are available to you, including just kind of, educating yourself and uh, acclimating to the language as Eli pointed out too that uh, because every discipline whether it's in the medical field or forestry field they we use terminology that we're familiar with but maybe doesn't resonate with others in terms of a definition right off the top of your head you know, ask if you don't know what basal area means or or why it's important ask I mean and um and so these are things that I think are, are critical sometimes that we, and I'm going to use myself as an example as a forester, I've had to really work hard at recognizing when a, a forestry term comes out and saying, oh, maybe the audience, you know, maybe I'm speaking to the Cattlemen's Association. They don't speak the same forestry lingo that I do, right? I mean, so uh, don't hesitate to ask. Next, other questions? I think we might just have time for one more question. Okay. Um, and if there are none that are feeling really important to folks, um, we might just have you each share some final closing thoughts for us for the day. Um, and then I'll, I'll hop up and make sure everybody knows that we want you to stick around. We've got pastries and cookies and chips and music. So, so let me pass this microphone down the row here and, uh, and just say it's been... I'll tip my hat, literally and figuratively, there to, to the Center for Agroforestry. It's extremely challenging to bring together science and also experience, but both are so critical to success stories. And so I'll tip my hat for, for the ability and the effort to do that related to civil pasture, which is complex, as Ashley stated it. And so pass it on from there. I love that. The only last thing that I would add, I've been thinking about this through um, today's talk and the learning circle yesterday is, uh, I, um, you know, did on, on, on what you said, and thank you so much to, to Hannah and everybody else here that made this possible and for having me. But um, I think that one little thing I might put in y'all's thought is I think we need to change the way that we talk about diversifying farms. Um, I think that a lot of the projects that don't go well 
uh, were a little too diversified. They had so many things going on. And if you think about kind of like me going, I don't want to pick pecans earlier. When you talk, when you think diversification and you think, well, I've got to run five different enterprises at once, or even just two, that can be like two full-time jobs, you know, depending on how, you know, what your skill is, how much labor is, you know, what, I mean, when we talk about diversifying, really, it's just you're diversifying how many responsibilities you have, you know, a lot of times. But I think we might need to change our language around that. I know my guys, if if you bring up diversifying around them, they just roll their eyes because they're like, we don't want to do anything else. And to me, I think the importance of a diversification is um, balancing cash flow or addressing other particular financial problems or seasonal problems or something where you've got, you know, income in one part of the year, but not another, or a high level of market volatility in one enterprise, but not another. And I look to um, what I think is the state's most, um, you know, kind of uh, reliable long-term uh, agroforestry model, which is the pine and cattle plantations. I think one of the reasons that work is not only as it's suited to the coastal plains really well, but it manages cash flow. So you've got, you know, your 20 or 30 year crop, whatever they cut their pine trees on, and then your annual uh, harvest of steers. And so I, I think that uh, we just, sometimes we, I mean, I don't, I might not make any friends by saying this, but for, for me, you know, I would love to live in like a kind of a permaculture like one of these, you know, drawings that we have up here where there's, it's like Garden of Eden. But when I think about trying to manage a farm, that's, at least from my experience, that's just not doable, you know. Um, we needed to be able to really focus in on certain enterprises that worked well, get rid of the ones that we didn't. Um, but I think pairing different enterprises, we just need to talk a little bit smarter and think a little bit smarter about it's not just, you know, does one animal fit with one plant, but like what is the, how are the economics around it? And I, I think this has been occurring to me because I'm concerned about, you know, I'm all about trees and, and farming, but I, I'm concerned about the longevity of, is this just a trend or are we going to figure out a way to manage the inevitable cash flow problems that you have with a slow growing perennial crop? So I would just say just being aware of what we mean by diversification. Uh, I think it is a trend and uh, regardless of where it goes after this, but I think, I think there's things we can do to um, like capture the value in the current trendiness of it and make, and make, uh make the value last beyond you know the five-year federal climate smart commodities grant money you know uh and, and i think to that end you know the the dynamic of there's there's the sort of silver pastor experts dispensing silver pastor knowledge which then gets um accepted which i think i think uh today's today the setup of of this event helps to address you know there's a lot of panels there's a lot of sort of discussion and i think that's great uh, I think the the more that everyone in this room and everyone on on the computer can sort of think of themselves as either a, a, a current export or, you know, whatever. Everyone is an expert in their own lived experience, and I think the more we can sort of think about that and, like, if everyone here makes sure to take a before picture of any of their planting, mark the spot so that you can take the after picture, so that you can be on this stage in a year or two years telling us about your experience that's that's really valuable so so i think i think just like solar pasture is really cool it's not the answer to all of our problems in all places but but and so i just think of that as being sort of freeing you know like we don't have to justify this as the the only like like I, I, sometimes I feel a lot of pressure to make it perfect. You know, I have to figure out every every problem before I can before I can recommend this. Otherwise, I'll be called an imposter, or, or otherwise, you know, the the whole enterprise, you know, the, the pendulum will swing the other way and say, you know what, we shouldn't have agroforestry at all. And I don't think, I think that puts too much on it. So I think if we can just like, as as Dr. Conway said, like the vibes are good, but but don't put too much pressure on them, and also take good notes take your before picture like like um this is a process and so so i think the more we lean into that the um the better it will go for all of us
All right. Thank you, Eli Roberts and Wynn Miller and Dusty Walter for moderating and all of the presenters for today. This has been awesome.